everyone. I am Bernard Young of ABF Yao and NUS Business School. I would like to welcome you all to this industry outreach, the impact of FinTech revolution, digital currencies on financial intermediation. ABF Yao is very grateful that ABS, NUS Business School and INSET co-host with us this event, which brings academics and practitioners together to discuss this very important and imminent topic. Um, let me first welcome the director of ABS, Mrs. Ong, um, and the dean of NUS Business School, distinguished professor Andy Rose, to make their opening remarks. Uh, Mrs. Ong, may I please? Thank you very much, Bernard. A very good evening to everyone and a welcome, warm welcome to at first webinar in collaboration with its partners. The Association of Banks in Singapore is honored to partner EFA, NUS Business School and INSEAD in this evening's industry outreach panel. Let me quickly introduce ABS. The association promotes the interests of our 150 plus members in Singapore's commercial and investment banking sector. More importantly, it facilitates the unique private and public partnership, the PPP, with the regulator MAS and other government stakeholders. These efforts help to reinforce Singapore as a leading global financial center. ABS has been collaborating with regional and international organizations, regulators, and stakeholders to serve our members and strengthen the industry. These initiatives are supported and encouraged by our dynamic and far-sighted council, which comprises the CEOs of the three local banks and 15 foreign banks. I'm glad that this evening we are able to bring together bankers, academics, practitioners, and policymakers to discuss a relevant and important topic, as Bernard has mentioned. We can look forward to an interesting and useful session as we distill the risks and opportunities presented by these relentless and rapid technological innovations. The fintech revolution, digitization and digital currency impact how we serve our customers, compete in the marketplace and shape our business models. In my 40 years as director of ABS, I've seen how these technological changes can be harnessed to serve the industry and the community better when we work together, the business, academia, policymakers, and other stakeholders, the people in the audience tonight. And setting the tone and direction in our discussion, we are blessed to have a panel of wise and experienced speakers. It gives me great pleasure to thank them for taking time and sharing with us. Mr. Samuel Sen, a distinguished banker, previously CEO OCBC and ABS Chairman Bank representative for two terms. He is one of ABS strongest advocates and my mentor. I learned lots from him. It is befitting that Sam continues to advise the OCBC board with his deep banking expertise and foresight. Then we have Dr. Tara Rice, Head of Secretariat for Payment uh, Committee and Market Infrastructures at the Bank of International Settlements. Dr. Rice has extensive domestic and international experience in financial markets and institutions. She has worked in senior positions at the uh, Fed Reserve and the US Department of Treasury. Thank you for joining us from Switzerland, Basel tonight. Finally, we have Professor Dave, Fernandez, Professor of Finance, practitioner at the Sim Kee-Boon Institute for Financial Economics at the Singapore Management University. Professor Fernandez lends his expertise in banking and financial intermediation. Our thanks also to Professor Antonio Fattas for moderating the session. Professor Fattas is a professor of economics at INSEAD and he has consulted for the IMF, the OECD and the World Bank. Last but not least, our thanks to the organizing team for having diligently put this webinar together. I wish all of you a fruitful panel discussion and thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Ong. 
Uh, ABFEO is really indeed very honored to have this esteemed panelist together with us. And also thank you then APS and along with uh, NUS Business School and INSET to co-host this. One of our AB, one of the ABFEL's objective is to bring academics and practitioners together and you help us to achieve this. For that, I'm, I'm very, very grateful to our Dean, uh, distinguished professor Andy Rose, um, and um, who, who would love to, who would love to be here tonight, but in spite of being a dean, in spite of his very busy schedule, he also is doing his teaching. And tonight his teaching happened to be in Europe. And therefore um, he, will, uh, he will make a, a pre-recorded opening remark. Uh, Tim, would you please play the, uh, Dean Andy Rowe's opening remark, please? Good evening, everyone. NUS Business School is pleased to partner with ABFER the Association of Banks in Singapore and INSEAD in this important industry outreach panel, the impact of FinTech revolution, digitalization and digital currencies on the financial system. This is a timely event. Digitalization and related innovations such as data analytics, DLT and cryptocurrencies, of course, can lead to potentially momentous changes in our payment system and more generally in financial intermediation. With all this change possible, there are fundamental questions on how our financial institutions should change their strategy and business models. Also, of course, from a social point of view, we want to explore how regulation can and should adjust to let digitalization improve our financial system's efficiency and safety. So it's completely appropriate for practitioners, policymakers, and academics to come together to discuss these important topics. We are grateful to our panelists. Mr. Samuel Tsien, ex-CEO of OCBC and advisor to the board of OCBC Bank, Dr. Tara Rice from the BIS, and Professor Dave Fernandez from SMU <clears throat> from the Sim Kee Boon Institute for Financial Economics. We look forward to having them share with us their insights and wisdom. NUS Business School is working hard also to contribute via our research and education. Primarily, of course, this is done through fundamental research that's conducted by members of the Department of Finance and through our support for the Asian Institute for Digital Finance, which we disseminate through standard scholarly fora, such as journal publications, but also conferences just like this, as well as through our students. Uh, we particularly have two relevant uh, associated uh, pre-experienced master's programs. So I wanna thank ABFER for organizing this panel and our partners, ABS and INSEAD for collaborating on this event. And I hope you all have a great panel discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Ong, and thank you, Dean Rose. Uh, I now turn the floor to Antonio. Uh, I look forward to a lot of learning and a lot of excitement and get really stimulated from you and the panelists. And again, thank you. And I look forward to, to the to listening and learning. Antonio, yours, please. And welcome everyone to this very interesting panel. Uh, I'm gonna give the floor in a second to the three panelists to make some opening remarks, but I just want everyone to know that if you have any questions, even before the remarks or during the remarks, please use the Q&A function. I'll look at those questions later when we start sort of a conversation between all of us. Uh, and I'll try to highlight some of the questions that I see there that are relevant. I'm going to panelists speak for about 10 minutes each. Uh, we'll go in the order that we have in our regional planning. So Sam will go first, then I'll pass the microphone to Tara, and then Dave will be the third one. Sam? Well, thank you very much, Antonio. Um, it's nice to be here. Good evening to all the people in Asia, and uh, good afternoon to the people joining us from uh, Europe. Good to see you, Bernie, and I will particularly thank you very much for your, for your, for your remarks. Um, Tara and Dave, it's the first time we meet on the screen, but uh, I know your background, very distinguished people, so I look forward to participating from you as well in this discussion. The topic that has been assigned for this um, panel, um, fintech revolution, digitalization, digital currencies, these are all very broad-based topic. In the way, each of these topic warrants a separate session on its own. So what I would like to do is to share my thoughts, particularly on three areas, and this is from a personal perspective, not necessarily from an institutional OCBC, my previous employer's perspective, but this is based on my experience of having been involved with the banking industry for 44 years, 
and my observations and my thoughts as to what's behind those observations. Now, I would like to talk about what drove this revolution or transformation as people say it. What is different this time and what is likely to be the future financial services scene? I will not be able to cover all of the subjects under this broad topic. Um, I'm pretty sure my fellow distinguished panelists, Clara and Dave, will be able to cover those aspects. And should there be any particular areas that you want me to share my thoughts, um, I'll be very happy to do it uh, at the Q&A session. First of all, I think it is beyond doubt that technology drives innovation and innovation drives transformation. This has always been the case in the past, currently, as well as going forward. I'm currently in Hong Kong, Tara is in Switzerland, and all of, most of you are in, are in Singapore. Technology has enabled this zero distance society for us to interface and interact virtually. So it is not something new. Uh, some people call it a new normal. I tend to call this as the next normal. Next normal means that there will be continued developments, continued innovations, and continued new behaviors and preferences as we move forward. So this is the next normal. If we just look at the history of development of the branch banking uh, services, for example, for the past 30 years, you will recall that you have to go to the branch physically in order to do your transactional services, whether it is putting money or borrowing money. Later on, with the invention um, of automatic teller machines, we bring the branch to your neighborhood. And then with further advancement in technology, we bring the branch to your home in the form of internet banking. And with the further development of technology, we bring the branch to your fingertips and the branch follows wherever you are. And this is mobile banking. So if you just look at this simple analogy as to what happened over the past 30 years, you will see that every step along the way, technology plays a very important role. Then the question is, is this just a normal type of transformation? What is different this time? Now, my observation is that what is different this time, and this is going to have fundamental impact on the financial services industry going forward, is that the suppliers of technologies this time, whether it is the FinTech companies or the big tech companies, they play a direct involvement role. They are no longer playing a supporting role. They are no longer a supplier only to the established institutions such as banks to improve their efficiency but they took an outside in approach to directly provide solutions to consumers. I would call this almost like a second curve. The first curve being the established institutions in the financial services area, such as banks, moving and progressing along one curve very aggressively. But then the technology suppliers, which previously only support the first curve institutions, have established a second curve and they move along the second curve with their own products, with their own services, with the support of technology. What's more is that they develop additional channels for themselves. They amassed additional data, which is not the traditional data themselves. So they became much more powerful, but they're still playing on a separate curve, they're playing on the second curve, which is the second curve. As a result of their coming into the picture, this transformation has in turn reshaped the consumer's expectation, consumer's preferences, and the consumer's behavior. They prompted demand by consumers for instant gratification, for personalization, for tailored experience. So the technology firms have become solution providers to demands that they instigated that was not there before. I, I would still call them the second curve. And I would then talk about whether the second curve and the first curve is going to converge or not. Because what's the, the distinguishment on the second curve is that the, the second curve create demand and create solutions to meet that demand, which is originally not there in the first curve. Then what is the future scene going to be like? I think the future scene 
is going to see the convergence of the first curve and the second curve. The entrance of the fintech companies, the big tech companies with their technology, they're now already coexisting with the banks within the financial system. They have developed to become what I would call platform companies with their data, with their consumers, with their channels. They have created a market structure that has led to the creation of an ecosystem that has got non-financial services bundled with financial services separate and together with the banks. Buy now, pay later, for example. I would call its embedded finance in the platform companies. They do not have to jump out of the ecosystem to do the financing. They're within that ecosystem to do the financing. They do not have to go separately to the banks. It becomes an embedded service that's available. So if you look at the technology companies, started off as a supplier to the established institutions such as banks, they develop on their own. They started with their transactional services, um, focusing on like movement of funds, such as payments, trade, to make it cheaper, faster, more inclusive, and better. And then they move on to become credit suppliers, such as buy now, pay later. They've now also moved on to investment services. The breadth of their services is now moving into what the banks tr traditionally offer. So this is what I call the first curve and the second curve converging into one, and it becomes a new ball game. This new ball game will give rise to new possibilities for the consumers, but it will also instigate new demands from the consumers. There are new asset classes that has been created. New experience services will also be created. Cyber currencies, NFT trading, there will be anticipatory demands that will come into place and not just demand of what you currently know, but anticipatory demands of these technology companies is able to offer going forward. There will be new concerns as well to see whether those new demands is going to create more velocity and more volatility for our financial services industry. My view is that there will be more velocity, things move faster, and there will be also be more up and downs, more more, more volatility involved. Whereas we need collaboration amongst the players in this converged first and the second curve, I think we should continue to encourage experimentation. But experimental change carries risks. And therefore, I think regulations and supervision needs to come into place to make sure that the excesses that is bound to happen will be within a realm of acceptable magnitude. Otherwise, it could create so much of the hype in the financial services industry by the consumers that may create risks that may be difficult to control. So these are my observations as to what happened, what is happening now, what is different this time. I bring in the concept of the first and the second curve and the convergence of that. I will stop here. I hope I've created enough questions and perhaps doubts on your mind. And I hope that they have prompted enough curiosity from you and also questions later. With that, I'll pass it on back to you, Antonio. Thank you, Sam. Thank you for those opening remarks. So I'm going to let Tara take the floor now for another 10 minutes. Tara. Thanks very much, Antonio. And uh, Sam, your comments uh, are spot on <laughs> and they lead right into what I was going to discuss is a little bit about supervision and regulation and um, the role of innovation and payments and our efforts in the CPMI to create common approaches, interoperability, and standards for cross-border payments. Um, so looking at the history of money is really, it's really fascinating. Um, it, you know, money's changed form drastically since, since the start of human existence. Um, very, very early on, I'm, I'm, many people know this, I'm not sure if everybody does, but very early on, money took the form of shells and stones. Uh, of course, now today we've got coins and banknotes and bank deposits and payment cards. And I'm going to talk about the new innovations as well. But a really important aspect of this is that all of these instruments have one thing in common, and that's that they're trusted. Um, people accept that these payment instruments, um, because they, can, they know that they can 
have the same value tomorrow. Um, so that they can spend it again without incurring losses. Uh, so what we're seeing today, and I'll, I'll get to this in a moment, is um, you know some some radical shifting in how um, we make we might consider money or whether we see fundamental changes in that money. Um, and so driven by you know as as Sam said, you know changes in consumer demand and technology and enha enhancements, we're seeing a lot of innovation, including mobile money, as was noted. Um, stable coins and central bank issued uh, currency, digital currency. So in order for these to be accepted, they require at least a similar level of trust as the commonly accept accepted payment instruments. And that's really where standards and supervision regulation come into play. We need to have that, that, that support and that oversight to make sure that we have trusted uh, and valued means of payment. Um, of all the latest payment innovations, uh, our view is that CBDCs can offer a lot of promise and a safe payment method um, because it's a direct claim on the central bank. Uh, annually, the CPMI has been doing a survey of central banks to ask them how they're thinking about um, innovations in CBDCs. And uh, our report will be out in about a month, um, but just an early preview. Um, we find that 90% 90 of the 80 respondents are engaged or will engage in CBDC related work. So this percentage has been going up very steadily over the last five years. There's a lot of consideration of work in wholesale CBDCs um, and many central banks or a number of central banks are working with the BIS Innovation Hub uh, on proofs of content, concept and pilots, et cetera. Um, but also in the area of retail CBDCs, there's, there's some progress there with three retail CBDCs um, already live. Um, so, so what's interesting about the CBDC projects is many of them are focused on domestic issue and, and use cases, but where we also see a lot of potential is in cross-border payments. Um, as you know, as anybody knows that's tried to make cross-border payments, they can be slow, they can be costly, the costs themselves are not so transparent, um, and they are not widely acceptable, accessible to everyone. Um, and so one of the benefits that CBDCs could offer in cross-border payments is the idea that we could start with a clean slate. So um, many of today's payment issues are, arise from the fact that we have um, legacy systems and all of these systems across different jurisdictions have developed in different ways, um, institutional differences, et cetera, et cetera. So what's important from, from our perspective as a standard setting body is to see if we can help to create those common approaches, interoperability, um, and standards. And so some of the work that's going on right now in CBDCs, and then I'll get to a couple other um, uh, projects, is thinking about sort of what, what approaches um, uh, are needed to see that we can use CBDCs across, um, across different um, working um, jurisdictions. So last year, the G20, we published a paper in advance of the G20, um, working with the BIS Innovation Hub and with the IMF and the World Bank. It was a stock take of provisional domestic CPDC designs. Mm -hmm. This year, we're taking that work further. We'll publish another report with the same group um, on a report that identifies and analyzes options for access to an interlinking of CPDC ecosystems that can improve cross-border payments. We're very excited about the work and it's moving along, uh, it's moving along well. But um, stable uh, CBDCs aren't the only game in town, so to speak. Um, there's been quite a lot of um, growth and development in the crypto asset market, and as well as the stable coin market, um, where it could potentially be used as a, as a means of payment. Um, therefore, to, um, to address, so, regulatory and supervisory um, issues, the CPMI with IOSCO has published a consultation paper um, in October of last year that looks at the ap ap applicability sorry, of our standards to stablecoin arrangements. Uh, the, the report is, um, it was out for consultation. We've received responses and we, we will finalize that report and publish that also ahead of the G20. Um, interestingly, the paper concludes that um, our standards, the principles for financial market infrastructures, 
apply to stable coin arrangements that perform systemically important payment system functions or other FMI functions. So this is really taking a stand and say, look, it's the same, same business, same rules, same risk, so to, or same risk, same rules, so to speak. So if you are actually a stable coin arrangement and you're being used for payments uh, and you are potentially systemically important, then you do have to follow the CPMI IOSCO standards. And so while, you know, let me turn quickly now to existing payments um, infrastructure. So while stable coins and CBDCs do have great potential to improve payments, we shouldn't overlook the really important work that's going on to make existing technologies um, work better and be more interoperable. So one area that um, we've been very focused on in the CPMI um, G20 cross-border payments program is improving the technical interoperability of payment systems across borders. And one way is to standardize sort of messages and APIs. Now that's a little technical. Um, not all of us uh, know maybe what ISO 20022 is, but it's essentially a messaging standard. Um, and if you think about all the message or all the payments, um, that, you know, cross-border payments around the world, if we all had similar standards on how we enter the data and to make that payment, we can have much smoother, much faster payments. So the work that we're doing right now is looking at really trying to find common structured messaging fields. Um, and um, we have formed a task force that involves representatives from central banks and from the industry to do just this. It's currently assessing the range of mes message types for cross-border payments um, and defining common elements in data that could be a applied across all these message types. Um, and the group hopes to um, produce a, a report with some initial recommenda recommendations this summer. And then let me just note one other um, piece of ongoing work um, closely related to that is the work to harmonize API protocols. So this is basically how we think about exchanging data. And if you're using your phone to make payments, um, it's accessing APIs um, to, to be able to make those sort of, sort of seamless messages. We've got a workforce for that as well. Um, and it is looking at ways to harmonize those APIs. Um, and call, we've called for proposals for um, standardized API protocols that we could use in cross-border payments. And we'll be um, looking to um, publish something on that later this year and into 2023. Um, so let me stop there. I've talked about four building blocks, um, but the entire cross-border payments program is, is 19 <laughs> and the CPMI is, is covering 11. So there's really a lot more to talk about here, uh, but let me turn it back to Antonio. Okay, thank you, Tara. So I now pass the floor to our last panelist, which is Dave. Dave, you have 10 minutes as well. Thank you. Thank you, Antonio. Um, and uh, it's a pleasure to uh, be part of this uh, distinguished uh, panel, uh, it, it being the, the third uh, as advantages and disadvantages. Uh, uh, and uh, I will end up, uh, I think, saying a few different things uh, and touching on a couple of different areas uh, than uh, Sam and Tara, um, in particular, just raising up uh, issues such as uh, cybersecurity and, and inc financial inclusion uh, and literacy uh, as well. Uh, but it, some will cover some of the other areas. And I just want to set some context for my remarks. Um, I left uh, investment banking uh, over three years ago uh, to return to the university uh, setting. Uh, and the emerging areas of research uh, at the SMU Simpy Boon uh, Institute, uh, FinTech is one of them, uh, sustainability, uh, financial inclusion and education, uh, literacy are two of the others. Uh, in the FinTech space, the way we've approached it is to partner up uh, with entities like the Asian Development Bank Institute uh, to extend our reach across uh, the Asian region, uh, but also with private sector participants like Grab uh, and C. Uh, and Dow us most recently in, in a class that I'll talk about uh, in just a little bit on financial literacy, inclusion, and technology. Uh, so I would point out that unlike uh, some of the other professors uh, who are participating uh, this evening, Prof. Uh, uh, Antonio, uh, Prof. Bernie, uh, the, we, uh, the recorded message we heard uh, from Prof. Andy, uh, I'm not a research uh, professor, I'm a practice professor. 
uh, meaning that my role at the university is to connect the academics here with finance practitioners. So with, those, with that perspective, uh, let me uh, go to the question of uh, digitization uh, in the financial sector and raise up some of the positive uh, aspects and uh, some areas of caution in sort of a, a eclectic uh, uh, um, uh, impressionistic way in terms of the ways that I've interacted with that question uh, over the past couple of years. Uh, let me start with some of the positives, uh, some evidences of efficiencies. Um, just last month, uh, we uh, published a book uh, together with the Asian Development Bank Institute. Uh, the title was Harnessing Digitization uh, for Sustainable Economic uh, Development. Uh, one of the chapters uh, in that book, a highlight, is of course a chapter contributed by Prof. Bernie, um, but there was also a chapter uh, by two researchers at University of Malaya in KL, uh, an attempt to study the relationship between digital financial inclusion uh, and bank system stability. Uh, these researchers uh, extended some existing literature to here in the Asian region uh, to this question, and they do find uh, some increases uh, it, that increases in digital financial inclusion uh, are positive related uh, to uh, bank sector stability. So uh, check on the positive side there. Uh, a second data point uh, I would raise uh, together with uh, one of my researchers here at the Institute, uh, we wrote another uh, Asia focused paper uh, that uh, was a contribution to the ASEAN Connectivity 2025 Master Plan, uh, in which we chronicled the connection between fintech uh, and inclusion uh, across ASEAN, including the lower income uh, CMLV, Cambodia, Myanmar, Laos, um, uh, Vietnam uh, countries. Um, technology and digitization, uh, we concluded, have a great potential uh, for the enabling of greater inclusiveness. Uh, and economic growth uh, in the region, uh, though they are certainly not panaceas, replacements uh, for human capital development, uh, physical infrastructure, and, and uh, sound regulatory environment uh, and the like. The, uh, the last uh, uh, data point on the positive impact uh, uh, and effectiveness of uh, uh, efficiencies of digitization that I would raise is a case study uh, that uh, we worked on regarding NUM, uh, N-I-U-M, uh, which used to be known as uh, Instaram. Uh, for those of you who are not uh, familiar um, uh, with this uh, company, uh, it started in 2014 uh, after the uh, founder uh, had trouble. Uh, Tara mentioned cross-border. Uh, he had trouble setting money cross-border uh, to organize a friend's uh, bachelor party uh, in, in Thailand. Uh, so it makes me think about the, uh, the movie Hangover 2. Um, but uh, this platform for an individual provides a, a more efficient um, remittance route uh, through an app. Uh, and for those of us uh, who are in Singapore and our clients uh, or users like myself, it has seamless integration into the uh, pay now. Uh, system. Uh, so in 2019, uh, five years after the company started, uh, we were writing this case study uh, on Neum and how it went from a P2P uh, platform focused on remittance uh, to then be dominated by its uh, B2B business. Uh, and we discussed in that case study what the next funding steps uh, would be. Uh, for those of you who follow the news, uh, Neum has been in the news quite a bit uh, lately, three years after our case study, uh, a celebrated Singapore unicorn uh, now expanding into the Americas. Uh, so that's enough of the, the cheerleading, uh, since I'm now back on the academic uh, side uh, of the university business policy uh, um, intersection. Uh, let me pivot a bit to uh, some of the challenges uh, posed by digitalization. Um, so since time immemorial, um, there's been this cat and mouse game uh, between fraudsters uh, who can potentially make huge financial uh, rewards and those who can uh, uh, chase and identify them. Uh, these threats are constantly evolving uh, and the booming growth of digital financial um, services uh, has, has accelerated uh, that potential. And we all know too well, uh, the very sophisticated phishing scams afoot today uh, and the resources uh, in response so far that the regulator has come up with uh, in terms of ways to uh, shield customers uh, from these attacks. Uh, for this, again, in the news, the latest uh, QR scam reported in the Singapore papers today. Uh, use your phone to scan the QR. You think you're using Grab uh, Pay, and, and they're asking you for personal information. Um, uh, the growth of this type of uh, fraud stems, of course, uh, in part from the digital transformation and wider touch points 
uh, with, they were having with customers. Uh, Sam uh, swept us uh, through the, uh, the the progression from branches to ATMs, and then, and there's decline now uh, is matched by the rise of customers using uh, these mobile phones, uh, sometimes with open IT platforms uh, in the cloud. Uh, so fraud, cyber attacks are operational risks at the firm level, uh, systemic risks uh, at the uh, financial system level. That's the first challenge. Uh, that I wanted to highlight safety, uh, security, cyber risk all go hand in hand uh, with this digitalization in the financial sector. Um, let me pivot to uh, um, uh, centralized finance uh, by non-financial uh, entities, big tech, Sam uh, also raised uh, this uh, point. Um, uh, obviously, crypto would be uh, an important topic uh, to uh, discuss here. I personally am no, uh, by no means an expert uh, in this area, though, um, like everyone else, uh, I noticed uh, the recent uh, announcement uh, by Meta for Facebook uh, regarding its uh, DM cryptocurrency assets, uh, and uh, certainly makes reference to some of the Terra's comments. It, it certainly seems uh, that it indicates uh, where uh, big tech has seen its lines uh, being drawn, uh, at least uh, for now. Uh, but what I am currently uh, exploring uh, is uh, another area that Sam touched on, ways in which platforms uh, like here in Singapore, uh, Grab, or in the region, Grab and C, uh, the parent company of Shopee, uh, are getting into our wallets. Um, both companies uh, have generously uh, agreed uh, to be project champions uh, in a class that I'm uh, teaching this semester, uh, uh, financial literacy inclusion and in, in technology. Uh, the other three project champions, by the way, are uh, Dawas, uh, SGX, and MoneySense. MoneySense is uh, the Singapore whole of government uh, effort at uh, financial um, education and literacy. Uh, in this uh, experiential SMU class, the, the students are exploring how to uh, expand the uses of services like Grab Pay Now, uh, which is their BNPL, uh, Sam mentioned, and uh, C Money, similarly. Uh, but doing so appropriately uh, relative to the financial literacy of the potential users. Yeah, these big platforms are the new, fi uh, new financial instruments that they introduce uh, have the classic balancing act of increasing business and financial inclusion, uh, but also potentially raising systemic destabilization if those users um, lack sufficient financial literacy. Um, academic studies uh, of this balancing act are still in their early stages, um, but uh, some early evidence on this uh, is worrying. Um, there was paper uh, done by another partner of our Simki Boone Institute, and that partner is Anna Maria Lusardi at uh, the Global Financial Literacy Excellence Center uh, in Washington, uh, where she and her co-authors studying only the US um, find first that financial literacy among millennials uh, is low uh, compared to the overall population. Uh, that second, uh, they are heavy users uh, of smartphones for paying bills, uh, for depositing checks, uh, for tracking their uh, spending. Uh, but third and most uh, disturbingly, uh, those who use their smartphones for such activities are more likely uh, to make costly financial mistakes uh, like overdrawing their accounts. Um, so lastly, uh, uh, Prof. Antonio asked me to speak about uh, the role of regulation. Um, here I'll uh, recall the words of uh, Joshua Eisenman, uh, who in a chapter of another book that we did with the ADBI, um, raises the specter of an arms race um, between uh, the state and the fintech uh, sector. Uh, early um, and heavier regulation would prevent uh, such an arms race uh, from escalating, uh, since without the innovators, uh, without it, the innovators would continue to overlook uh, the public good aspect of, of financial stability. Um, I don't, don't know if that's the, uh, the right way forward, uh, but I would say is uh, I find it uh, uh, as a former finance practitioner, uh, a very enlightening journey to work uh, more directly with these uh, fintech innovators uh, under the watch of a vigilant regulator uh, as this digitization races forward. Thank you. Thank you, Sam, and thank you to the three panelists just sticking to the 10 minutes that I had allocated to them. Uh, so we're going to open now a question and answer section. Uh, 
any of the participants, please, if you want to post more questions on the q and I'll try to pick on them. I'll add some of my own questions or the issues that were raised during their presentations. Now, let me start sort of uh, asking questions to a particular panelist, but the others can certainly intervene and if you have any thoughts on those as well. I'm going to start with some, uh, as you raise the issue of how technology is sort of changing the financial sector and how we're seeing so many changes, new players, whether it's big tech platforms or think tech companies. I mean, as you look at the world, clearly the, the trends are similar, but, but the outcomes are very different. So if you look at Europe, uh, you still have banks dominated dominating a lot of the action. Some of the fintech players are becoming banks themselves. So they're sort of taking the same space that the banks have. If you look at Asia, you have more of the fintech companies or the big tech companies creating their own space, the super apps that both of you have mentioned in, in your space. Are we going to see a convergence of all these models or is it that regulation and market power of the incumbents, the banks, is very different across all these regions and we might see a completely different picture depending on the region of the world that we're in. Uh, thanks for raising this point. My view is that, uh, say, Europe and Asia, they are different on the maturity level in terms of developing and developed economies. So here in Asia, we still have quite a bit of developing economies. And as a result of that, um, a financial inclusion is really an issue that we need to address. And it's good and bad. Bad in the sense that they are less developed and therefore poorer in the economic sense, but they also create more opportunities for us to be involved with provision of services which go through the digital channel that we can reach them. Whereas if you look at Europe, because it's more of a developed place, that drive, that impetus, to use digital banking as a prompter to bring them to become a more financially inclusive society is less severe than that of Asia. Now, this is a near-term view. The longer-term view, I still take the view that there would be banking services embedded into a ecosystem of which the banks is a node Technology companies is a note, but they interact with each other. And whether banks will become a part of a bigger ecosystem or the banks will be the leading um, uh, node of an ecosystem doesn't really matter. I think banking services will continue to be required. The banks will continue to be required, but the banks will be working with many other companies, including technology companies, including consumer companies, including channel companies to perform a comprehensive service for the consumers. And that comprehensive service is not only to fulfill their transactional requirements, it is to fulfill their, their future demands, their anticipatory demands, and many of those demands may be experiential. Now, we haven't talked about uh, metaverse, which is a, a, a hype right now. I, I still think it's a hype right now. But on the other hand, it's got some beauty in the sense that we go beyond what we traditionally look at as something tangible and we go into experiences. I think banks as well as technology companies will probably move towards that direction. Ultimately, consumers are looking for a satisfaction, a gratification, and not only a tangible solution to a tangible experience. It is an experience that they would like to go through and banks will be able to move into that direction together with the tech companies. I think that is something that we need to bear in the back of our mind as we develop products and services. Don't look at what we currently have. We have to look at what the future anticipatory demand of the consumers is going to be and how can we create products to fit into that. Thank you, that's very clear. Uh, Antonio, do you mind if I- Go uh, ahead, Dave, of course. No, just uh, I, I totally agree with everything that uh, Sam said, I would just, uh, you know, drive home the point that he made in terms of the difference uh, between uh, Asia and uh, a region like Europe in terms of the inclusion aspects, uh, the magnitude of the size of the un unbanked and underbanked uh, in this region is, uh, is enormous. Uh, and therefore the potential is there uh, with the, the technology, but I wanna underline again 
uh, the critical importance then of a rapid, just as rapid an increase in the financial literacy uh, of those uh, of those new uh, entrants uh, into the system using these these technologies, because otherwise. So uh, we could be even raising risks uh, further as we include them. Okay. I have a couple of questions on the Q&A that are about CBDC. So I'm going to ask that question to Tara first, because uh, the other panelists can add their comments afterwards. Uh, so there's a question of uh, about how, what is the role of commercial banks if CBDC is launched? And a little bit linked to the question I asked Sam, uh, I mean, to what extent CBDC can help create more competition or will give more power to banks or will give more power maybe to new entrants? Uh, and there's a question as well about all the standards that you mentioned, uh, some of them very technical. Uh, and what, what is new about those standards versus the ones we're using today, like SWIFT uh, and other standards that exist? Again, it's not quite the same as CBDC, but in some cases, it might be a complementary question. Great. Uh, thanks a lot. Excellent um, set of questions. So the first one's what's the role of the commercial banks uh, with CBDC? Um, so there, that's still up for <laughs> debate, I would say. Um, there's a, a paper that was done last year, we're, we're still building on it, that looks at different types of models um, that you could have with, with a CBDC and how it would interact with the commercial banks. So you know, one key piece of any transaction is the know your customer bit, AML, CFT compliance, so anti-money laundering um, compliance, and there is quite a regime built around that to make sure that the transactions that we that we make are, you know, they're safe, they're legitimate, they're not supporting any illicit sort of um, activities. So, if you can, you can think about a model where. Um, the central bank does everything, including, including that know your customer, you know, receive AML CFT compliance. But then you think about, okay, how many commercial banks, or sorry, how many central banks would really like to take on that job? Um, I think in practicality, the numbers would be very, very low. So then you can think about a situation where the banks who, who have structures and, and monitoring systems in place for AML and CFT, that they continue to, to do that role and, and other roles that they take with regards to their retail customers. And so then the you know, households would have their account with the bank. Um, and you could think about then being able to use the CBDC, but then the bank is sort of an intermediary making sure that those are, those are legitimate transactions and it's doing that, that monitoring um, that, um, that the central bank would then not have to do. So there's, and, and then, you know, there's a spectrum. Let's just say there's a spectrum of how involved the commercial banks could be. Um, now, where do we think we're going? Well, that's, you know, that's anyone's guess. <laughs> but I would say that I, I do see, I do see a, a continued role for banks um, in this space. Um, and then just one more point to that, um, and I'll talk about the other two quickly. Um, the CPMI, before the CPMI was the CPMI, it was CPSS. Um, wrote a paper back in 2002 talking about the role of central bank money in transactions. There's a lot in that report that is still very valid today. And one of the main messages in that report is that we consider two types of money to be very safe. The first one is central bank money. That's the ultimate settlement asset. Uh, we trust the central bank. Um, the central bank's role is actually to, to support that, that trust. Uh, and next is commercial bank money. Uh, and we consider commercial bank money to be um, trustworthy, trustworthy because of the role of oversight, supervision, regulation, and the close um, connection that they have both with the central bank and also with the, the, the jurisdiction, the authorities of the state. Um, so I, I, I continue to see a role there for banks. Um, but as Sam said, that role is going to evolve over time and there's a number of ways it could happen um, based on initial conditions, so to speak, jurisdictional conditions. Um, so I spoke quite a long time on that. Let me turn to standards and what's new. Um, so the standards that we have, the Principles for Financial Market Infrastructures, PFMI, were developed in 2012 in the aftermath of the great um, financial crisis um, to ensure that we um, have safe and sound and efficient payment systems and other FMIs. 
Um, we consider those standards to be technology neutral. That means we do think that they apply to stablecoin arrangements and other um, digital currency um, arrangements. The, the exception would be that there are some areas for which we need to provide guidance and we've done that. Um, that's what the consultative report is about. And as things further develop, there may be a need for, for more of this type of guidance on how our standards apply. But unlike, for example, the Basel Committee um, standards, those are, those are the capital ratios are a very quantitative standard. Um, the CPMI and IOSCO principles are, are very, well, principle-based um, and no hard set numbers. So that makes them a little bit more flexible in how they can be applied. Um, and then finally, on the last question, Antonio was on competition and new entrants. Um, and it is the question how we will see that, whether... Which is about how CBDC can either help incumbents right. or new entrants, or it would make no difference to that competition. So I, um, I think we're at a watershed moment. Um, all of those, um, you know, all of the technology, all the discussion we've had about consumer demands, wanting different, you know, wanting things to be faster, easier, more convenient on our phones. I think that's creating uh, that technology combined with this point in time where we have the G20 program, the cross-border payments program, we have the political support, support to make changes. Um, and now we're seeing a lot of competition. I think CBDCs is only going to further that competition because we'll have new apps to use it on. It'll make, it could potentially make cross-border payments much easier. We could be using WISE to transfer our CBDCs across borders, for example. So I see, um, I see that furthering uh, competition, but not necessarily as a type of currency, right? So I, I think, you know, CBDCs, when they are really developed and used, would be great for wholesale payments between large financial institutions. It'd be great for uh, wholesale transactions in between central banks. Uh, so there's lots of, lots of potential there. Um, I'll stop there. Okay, thank you. Now, let me ask Antonio, you. Uh, this yeah, is, go ahead. If I may, okay, if I may ask a follow up question, particularly for Tara, because she's very knowledgeable in this area. You see, um, I, I, I'm, I'm not too familiar with the CBDC, but the point is that um, in the extreme, where everybody ended up with their money with the central bank, then the commercial bank will have no money creation role that they used to play because previously they have the money placed with them. They have to find an outlet for them to earn some earnings on the money. But in the extreme case where the central banks become so successful in CBDC, where all the monies are parked there, how would that impact the commercial bank's role in the local economy to create money through the multiplier effect that they are used to? That's a, that's a very important consideration. Um, so, right, so commercial bank money is actually the majority of money we have in society, right? So yes. bank, right, um, we have fractional, fractional reserves. Um, so, but, but I, I still, I, it will be a big question um, to think about, okay, how could CBDCs affect monetary policy? How could they affect this money multiplier, right? How could they affect commercial bank money usage? But if we think about the role, the broader role of intermediation of the commercial bank, right? Um, and here's where we could have new entrants as well, sort of in the, in the lending market, right? Um, and it may not just be banks. And we know it's not just banks, right? There's, there's fintechs that are lending. But I, but I, I do believe that, that some of the, that the role that the commercial banks have in, in lending um, investment banking, in all these other different um, aspects of financial services, I believe that will continue. And so if you think about, if you think about the CBDC, I mean, reserves in and of themselves are, currently reserves are, um, uh, are digital. So, right, commercial bank holds its reserves with the central bank, and then um, it is able to then Right, use its balance sheet to lend, et cetera. I don't see that role changing a lot, but we can think about maybe those reserves that are quote unquote, not really dollars electronically, but CBDC electronically. Um, but I think, yeah, again, um, you know, we're trying to see the future, um, but that's my, that's my prediction. <laughs> 
Yes, so it can't be too successful. If it's too successful, everybody puts their money into the central banks and there's no more intermediation function that the commercial banks play so well. Yeah. yeah. I mean, my understanding is many of the central banks that are looking at CBDC, they're considering caps on the balance of those accounts. So they're not thinking of an unlimited balance. They're thinking about caps to be defined and that would limit the scope of the balances on CBDC. I see. Yeah. That's true. Now, let me ask a broad question. I'm going to start with Dave, but I think everyone can give an opinion on this, which is about regulation. Uh, I mean, my sense, everyone is complaining a little bit about the regulators. Uh, I mean, if you look at uh, the DM Association, which is a follow-up to Libra coming from Facebook, now Meta, uh, they sort of dropped the ball, they stopped doing what they're doing, and they complained that regulators were not listening uh, and they were not willing to innovate. If you talk to banks, they say, well, sometimes regulators are not strong enough. They're letting a lot of this sort of action happen and things are going to become too volatile. There's too much risk. So there's a little bit of complaint on, from every point of view. I mean, are regulators moving fast enough? Have they ignored what they had to do? And that's why everyone is complaining. Uh, I mean, who's right? Or is it that everyone is just yelling because they're trying to get sort of the regulators on their side? So let's start with Dave, but anyone can intervene, of course. Well, thank you. I, I should, uh, you know, full disclosure, my uh, first job at a university was at the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. Um, and, you know, I, I think that uh, they, they have been in the, uh, in the belly of the regulator. I think if, if there isn't complaining, then you're not doing your job uh, properly. Um, and so you should be, uh, that, uh, that uh, uh, chorus should be expected to be heard. Um, I think in terms of uh, how are they coexisting uh, with, the, um, uh, with the innovators uh, in, this, uh, in this space, I, I raised you know, this, uh, uh, this point of view you know, taken by uh, Joshua Eisenman or the specter. Uh, of this arms race where it really is a battle uh, then and an escalating one uh, at that uh, and, and not at all a uh, it paints a picture of a cooperative uh, or a, a partnership uh, between uh, the two but uh, but a, a, a war analogy um, I, I think that uh, it, it's, it's always a delicate uh, balance uh, in this particular area in this particular time when the innovation is happening so quickly and uh, very importantly, uh, you have entities that are outside of the remit uh, of, the, uh, of the, uh, the, the central bank regulator. Uh, it really does see, feel like a situation for a more open architecture, uh, the, the sandbox term that, that uh, continues to be used, I think, properly. So um, you know, for the regulator to set uh, broader boundaries, uh, to be watchful and be involved. Uh, as these uh, innovations uh, and new products uh, continue to, to be developed. I think that's uh, hopefully academics also uh, have a, a role uh, in, that, uh, in that discussion, uh, but uh, I think it, it's much better and much more productive uh, and much uh, better for stability uh, if that is one that's, uh, that's collaborative uh, where all doors are, are open as these things move forward. I think uh, at the end of the day, you know, that, that complaining, um, uh, you know, it, it should be part uh, of the of the dynamic. Um, I, I tell you, I'll, I'll veer slightly off. I saw in the, the chat that there was this uh, example or, or question around uh, fraud, which is one of the points uh, that I had raised in asking about uh, the role of regulator, uh, you know, in this. And, and you can see, and I'm sure everyone is annoyed uh, with some of the things that are uh, the little roadblocks that are putting uh, put in. And, and as you do your transaction on your banking app. It might take uh, approximately two seconds more uh, to do what you wanted to do uh, because of phishing reminders and other things uh, that come up uh, and hence uh, complaints uh, that would uh, arise from that. But it seems, uh, again, sort of natural sort of pause, roadblock, uh, call for discussion when these things are happening at such a rapid pace. So no, if they may just uh, add to what Dave had said, to which I, I totally agree. I think regulators are really necessary, particularly now when there is so much experimentation going on, where there is so much new services being introduced to companies who are not traditionally in this trust business. We need to make sure that there is a supervision. 
I was a regulated um, person when I was working for a bank. And I can see the importance of regulators being there to make sure that any excesses is being contained and any new services are really thought through before something happened. Because we have to bear in mind that this is not a private sector regulator. This is public sector. This is a public sector regulator for the public trust to be preserved. Tara mentioned, uh, brought up the issue about trust, which I totally agree. The whole financial system builds around trust. And therefore you need somebody to make sure that it is contained in the way and it will move forward, will allow that to move forward. But any excesses um, that we see should be contained as soon as possible. So I, I, I think the regulation is absolutely required, particularly going forward as more and more players who were not traditionally in the field of maintaining public trust got involved. I would just have two quick points to add, if okay, Antonio. Yep. Uh, I agree with with um, Dave and Sam, and <laughs> I would have said I would have said what Dave said too. You know, if if uh, if we're not hearing complaints, you know, regulators and supervisors aren't doing their job, in part. Um, so I just wanted to say one, make one comment about the consultation responses that we received on the stablecoin um, report because I think it, um, you, you know, goes to Dave, Dave and Sam's points. So what, there was really a, a bifurcation of, of responses. The, the new entrants, so the you know stable coins and crypto asset exchanges, um, they say don't don't regulate us now. You need to think a little bit more, and you need to you know see how things develop, uh, and then you need to create a new system for us. <laughs> I'm exaggerating a little bit, but it's basically like don't do anything too fast, don't do anything yet, and we need a, our, a bespoke regime. The incumbent said, look again, same business, same risk, same rules. We have standards, we have regulations. Everybody needs to follow those. Um, so that was just a really interesting divide to read through, and we'll, we'll, pu we'll publish all of those consultation responses very soon. Um, the second point is um, what um, my, old, my advisor used to call the Hegelian dialectic, which is thesis, antithesis, um, synthesis, or another way to put it is regulation, innovation, re-regulation. Uh, and so there's really this fine balance to, to, um, to find. Um, between allowing and supporting innovation, um, public private sector innovation can really do a lot of great things, um, but we still need to protect the safety um, and efficiency of our payment system. Good. Now, let me ask another broad question that comes from the one question in the Q&A, uh, which is about the notion of decentralized finance, uh, which is obviously very much involved these days. That there's a lot of talk about it. There's a lot of funds going to that sector, uh, and beyond the technological aspects of decentralized finance, that there's sort of a fundamental sort of proposition, which is we don't need intermediaries. We we can sort of have organizations without intermediaries making decisions on on financial decisions on payments, uh, and we don't need the traditional intermediaries at all. Now, I, I see myself a little bit of a contradiction when you look at what is happening in decentralized finance, because you end up with these sort of centralized entities that are sort of being the, the window to decentralized finance. I mean, is this something which is overhyped? Is this something that that technology could at some point be real uh, across many financial or across many parts of the financial sector? Or is this something that will go away as time passes? Any views on that one? I'm, I'm happy to start. Um, Good. So um, it's a really good point that 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 we that DeFi is supposed to be decentralized, but there's actually centralized entities um, that are a large part of that. Um, our view, my view, my personal view is that um, entities and activities that are created to get around um, the current system and our current, you know, compliance. Um, generally used for illicit activities um, really have no place. Uh, and, and there is quite a lot of activity in the decentralized space um, that we can't see, that we can't confirm, and that could be possibly illicit um, activity. Um, and so for, you know, at least from a standard setting slash regulators perspective, I would want to see DeFi become more <laughs> centralized 
um, and for us to be able to have a bit more oversight uh, and transparency into those systems. There can be some good, um, but again, back to my other statements, um, we do need to know that it's transparent. We do need to know that it's overseen and we do, ne do need to make sure that transactions don't go sort of outside the regulated system where uh, we don't know where they're going. Any additional views on decentralized finance? Okay, let me bring a topic. I think Dave, you mentioned this quickly, otherwise I know you've done work on this. Uh, the, the topic sort of like green finance, green technologies, uh, and, and how in, it interacts with some of the developments we, we have been discussing here. Um, uh, again, to what extent technology can help or cannot, but also there's, there's of course the discussion on some of the sort of cryptocurrencies, the use of energy, and to what extent an increasing awareness of the need to have sort of a green technology in finance will be a deterrent to some of those technologies. And any thoughts on to what extent we see that type of conversation modifying the way we think about the use of technology? Thanks, Antonio, for, for raising you know, sustainability, um, because I do think all of these are, can be uh, can be linked to, together, technology being uh, the driver uh, behind all of that. Um, and also, I would point out that from a, you know, uh, I, I cited a study by Anna Lusardi and, and her team uh, focusing on millennials. And, uh, you know, as we talk about technology, it is a particular group to, to think about. Um, and so within this space, there are lots of things to raise. You mentioned a few. Let me uh, just mention a couple, uh, you know, that, uh, that I've been thinking about. Um, so investments. Uh, side of things. Uh, I mentioned another one of our uh, um, uh, project champions in this in this class I'm doing now is Dallas, a robo advisor uh, here in in Singapore, uh, and and uh, I kicked off uh, uh, last year on a panel with them uh, on the uh, their offerings now of ESG uh, linked uh, investments. Um, we've done a preliminary uh, light study of of, of uh, millennials in the U.S. and Singapore. Uh, for their proclivity to uh, take some of their investments and allocate it uh, toward these uh, labeled uh, sustainable investment uh, products. And at the same time, testing not just their financial literacy, uh, but also their literacy on sustainability. <laughs> Do they understand uh, just that dynamic that is leading to the creation of these uh, uh, of these uh, uh, products. Uh, so early days uh, on this, but I, I think that uh, um, it's, it, it's, it's as, as uh, platforms such as these begin more easily to offer uh, these investment opportunities, I'll, I'll sound off again on, on education um, and literacy. Do these customers know about those uh, sustainably linked uh, products uh, that are now uh, exploding? Uh, in terms of their proliferation and their availability uh, to a population, millennials, uh, young people in particular, who who have uh, who indicate uh, a desire uh, to uh, put their investments uh, in that uh, in that direction. Uh, so um, I think there's uh, potential again is huge uh, if they are able to uh, send uh, some of their assets, uh, their savings into this uh, area. Um, but uh, questions again about their understanding uh, and literacy around these uh, sustainable linked products. Um, you know, another thing that uh, quickly I'll, I'll mention in the in the link between the technology and uh, and finance would be an area around uh, completely different, but on verifiability or verifying around uh, when you look at um, sustainability uh, measurement uh, and standards. Uh, that are being set up. If you think of the climate space and looking at uh, carbon emissions, um, uh, other uh, types of measurables, uh, the the ability to uh, to use all of this new technology to get to the really sticky question of verifying, uh, since so much of this is uh, still self-reported, uh, is just another aspect uh, of this to watch. Okay. Any comment on this, um, or Tara? No, I agree with uh, what Dave said. I think technology plays a role in the sense of making sure that we are channeling it in the right direction. The platform that has been used to monitor the progress is driven by the technology. The finance itself may use technology to reach a broader base of uh, provider of funds 
Um, the technology can also be used to monitor the use of funds. Um, so they are indirect in that sense. The technology does play a role in making sure that we're doing the right thing. Thank you. Okay, let me be as disciplined as my panelists were and the, let me stick to our time. So we just reached uh, our time uh, and I would like to thank our three panelists, uh, Sam, Tara and Dave for being part of this initiative. So I'm gonna pass the floor to Bernard who's gonna close the session. Thank you. Um, Antonio, Sam, Tara and Dave. Uh, thank you very much for a wonderful evening. Great conversation, you stimulate us a lot and let us provide us with, a, with an overview of what's well forthcoming and also filled with our mind a lot of really interesting questions. As Antonio knows, I send him a lot of questions. And so I just want to thank you all for really a great uh, discussion very stimulating and we learn a lot. I also want to take this opportunity to thank our audience. Uh, thank you for your, your earnest participation. I still look at the, my screen and see all the questions there. Uh, thank you for your support. Thank you for making this a really stimulating event. And I want to thank ABS. I want to thank uh, ABS uh, and US Business School and INSEAD for coming together to allow this meeting of mine between the academics and the practitioners. And um, Mrs. Ong, would you like to uh, make a closing remark before we sign off? Yeah, thank you very much. I've been listening and I've always said in the banking sector, I've been like an analog, I've been like a dinosaur. Sorry for my grandchild. So, Lord, thank you. Thank you very much. Let me just switch up before you keep on hearing the kids. Sorry, this is the time of the night. They are most active. <laughs> It is wonderful to see the future of finance and technology. Sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> yes, sorry, yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> and, and also, I want to thank um, the team behind this. You have worked very hard to make this a flawless event. And again, thanks to Antonio, Sam, uh, Tara, and Dave. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and also a special thanks to Mr. Kim Chiu, uh, Kim, Kim Chiu Chua, who started this idea. Thank you very much, everyone. I really enjoyed tonight, and I really hope that we can do this again. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank Bye, you everyone. Very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Have a good weekend.